Okay, everyone. <laughs> it's so nice to see everyone. Um, I was all set to welcome people, and then I managed to um, I managed to exit the meeting. So, welcome. Uh, I'm very glad uh, that to see everyone here today. And um, I am Glenda Bullock. I am the program chair of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. And this is our November meeting, um, meeting on Zoom this month. I hope your day is going well. It's a chilly day here in Michigan. Uh, so I hope that uh, you're looking forward as I am to our virtual trip to the tropics. Uh, our speaker today is Renee Tady. She's the author of Detroit Tiki, A History of Polynesian Palaces and Tropical Cocktails. And our online host for today's program is the Ann Arbor District Library. They provide us with promotional and tech support on Zoom. And we are always very, very grateful to them for their, for their help and support. And you can find recordings of our past programs on the library's YouTube channel, which is AADLTV. Um, by now, I, I imagine we're all pretty familiar with how Zoom works, but yeah, if you don't want your face to show during the recording, um, you can turn off your video. Your microphone will be muted during the talk, but Renee will take questions at the end as time allows. And you can also post your questions and your comments in the chat and uh, just select uh, Ann Arbor District Library as the recipient. Um, uh, or Renee as the recipient. And uh, one more tip at the top of your screen on the right hand side, there is a button that says view and you wanna click speaker view or side by side view instead of gallery view uh, for your best viewing experience. Um, we always like to say uh, for those who might be joining us for the first time today, uh, a little information about our organization. We are an informal uh, group of people who are interested in the history and the culture of food and cooking. And we have monthly meetings between September and May. And since September of 2020, most of our meetings have been on Zoom, but we are gradually starting to add back in some in-person talks as well. Um, we have twice yearly potluck theme meals. We had our first in-person meal uh, in over two years this past July with the Caribbean theme. And coming up, uh, we're looking forward to our December meal, which will feature food from the Bonnet British Isles. And just a reminder to our local members, if you're planning to come to the theme meal, please return your reservation forms to Phil Zeret and let him know what you are planning to bring. And if you're not a member of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor, we would love to have you join us. Our membership is $25 a year, and that's for an individual or a family. And it includes a subscription to our quarterly magazine, Repast, which is edited by Randy Schwartz. Uh, if you'd like to join our group, there's membership information on our website, which is culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org, and just click on membership, and you can join with PayPal. So now it's time to introduce today's speaker, uh, Renee Tady. She was born in Detroit. She resides in the metro area. She says she's passionate about all things vintage from autos and architecture to film, clothing, home furnishings, and lifestyle. And she's especially fond of mid-century modern design. Detroit Tiki, published by the History Press in 2022, is her first book. So on behalf of the culinary historians of Ann Arbor, welcome, Renee. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you for having me here. And thank you to the culinary historians and Tyler at the library for taking care of all of the technical details. Um, I am sitting here with my tiki cocktail, a painkiller. Uh, I hope some of you are enjoying a cocktail too. Um, the way I like to do this is I like to read from the book certain sections and then go to the slides and go through the slides and tell you about those. So if everybody is all comfortable, let's get started. Tyler, if you want to go to the slides. Okay, next. That's pretty much, that's what's sitting next to me here. Next. Okay, the early days. So a lot of people uh, associate Tiki with like the 1950s, 1960s, but it actually started long before that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of it. 
In the late 1800s, writers such as Herman Melville, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Jack London told exciting tales of their South Seas adventures in novels such as Treasure Island, In the South Seas, Taipei, Amu, and Marty. The popularity of the books was undisputable. In 1922, Bur Burlingham Travel Pictures released The Lure of the South Seas, a documentary giving ordinary folks a real insider look at that part of the world. By the late 1920s, so 1920s, Hollywood had taken notice of the trend and decided to jump aboard. Hollywood had the ability to recreate the beauty of the South Seas right there in sunny California. Artists and set designers turned palm fronds, weathered wood, tapa cloth, tufa rock, hemp rope, primitive weapons, masks, nets, and Japanese glass fishing floats into exotic locales. Tiki culture began to gain foothold in 1933 when Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant, who later changed his name to Don Beach, opened a Polynesian themed restaurant in Hollywood, California called Don the Beachcomber. Today, he is credited as being the founding father of tiki culture. Using relics he collected from his travels throughout the South Pacific, he decorated the space with flaming torches, rattan furniture, straw matting, and bright patterned fabrics. Ideas were plucked straight from the movies and turned into Polynesian themed bars. The Coconut Grove, Christian's Hut, and the Hurricane all came from the big screen. The image of a woman in a sarong or grass skirt was snatched from movie posters and applied to tiki bar menus, matchbooks, mugs, and promotional items. They even borrowed special effects such as rain on the roof and storms. The movement that started in California and the West Coast headed across the country to New York and Florida and then infiltrated metropolitan cities such as Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. Let's face it, things were pretty grim at the time. The Great Depression had paralyzed the United States from 1929 to 1939, and then World War II broke out in 1939. Who wouldn't want to escape into a carefree world of tropical leisure where your troubles were left at the door? Next slide. And you can go one more. So you have to remember that Prohibition ended in 1933. So the rum runners had been working all that time, uh, done a good job keeping people's thirst for alcohol quenched. But at the end of Prohibition, people could go back to things like whiskey. So there was a lot of rum. It was cheap. It was plentiful. So the tiki restaurants, their drinks were rum-based. So I've got some pretty pictures. You can go next. All the different next. A home tiki bar. Next. Lovely. Next. And you can go one more. Okay. So then we're heading to downtown Detroit. And the first place, you can go one more. Thank you. Okay. So we're in downtown Detroit now. The year is 1941. Detroit joined the crowd in 1941 with the tropics at the Hotel Wolverine. The Detroit Free Press article on June 15, 1941, announced the upcoming opening of an atmosphere nightclub called The Tropics. It is described as a triple level affair created in the mood of the South Seas with bamboo, palm trees, and other tropical touches. The article goes on to say, the novel touch of bamboo and palm leaf huts instead of the all too familiar booths in the village room are a distinct innovation which should catch the public fancy. And then they go on to describe it. So we have to use our imaginations today on this chilly day. It was the case of Muhammad and the Mountain Thursday night at, in Detroit where those after dark pleasure seekers of the Motor City who couldn't go to the tropics for relaxation found the tropics brought to them with all of the trimmings. 
In short, Detroit's newest and gayest night spot, the Tropics, opened at the Wolverine Hotel Thursday to a large crowd who found its decor and sub-equatorial mood strictly to their taste. Giant palm trees and bamboo huts, throbbing drums and gay colors, waitresses in sarongs and Hawaiian lays, and a general color scheme of light green and gold lent atmosphere to this club, which bids fair to the gathering place with those with the South Seas on their minds. An imposing entrance, complete with a green neon palm tree, marks the outside of the club. And inside, on street level, there is a long double bar built in the style of a shelter, complete with tin roof from which rain drips steadily and noiselessly before lighted murals of distant landscapes. At the far end of the bar, a small gallery with bamboo railing looks down upon the tropical village in which bamboo huts replace the customary booths and a small stage is located for the band to play. There is another bar on the lower level leading to the village. Upstairs, there is a triple level dining room with dance floor and bandstand and the bands by means of a hydraulic lift can be shifted from the village in the dining room in double quick time. So how fascinating is that, that they had a hydraulic lift that the whole band would go from floor to floor. There's never a dull moment at this club, which has novelty, color, pace, and atmosphere to attract pleasure seekers and to transport them, if only temporarily, to the land of soft winds, the blue lagoons, and the bright skies. The, the building that the tropics was in, the Hotel Wolverine, that was built in 1921 at a cost of $3 million. At the time, it was Detroit's newest and finest hotel, catering to the rich and famous of the day. And then in 1941, when the tropics opened, they added a sign at the top of the building that said the tropics room. So here we have the ad uh, of the opening. Um, on the left, we have an ad for Club Valley that was also in Detroit at the time. Uh, next slide. This is the tropics, this is their cocktail menu. And if you look close, you can see it's divided into three sections three pages of drinks. I mean, amazing. And of course, here we have the girl in the grass skirt and the palm tree, very typical for that time. Next. This is the Hotel Wolverine. And if you look on to the left, you can see where they have, uh, they put the sign for the tropics and the entrance with the palm tree there. And unfortunately, um, the hotel, the Tropics was there from 1941 to 1963. Um, in 1968, the Wolverine Hotel closed, and in 1997, it was imploded. Next, this is a postcard, and it, it's really cool how you can see the band on the lower level and then the band on the upper level, and the, how they had just how it was all spread out and they had dancing all over and the huts. Next. I like this postcard too. Uh, it has a down on the bottom, there's a little sign that reminds people to buy war bonds. This is circa 1942. Next. And this is the traveling bandstand. You know, it, it's a shame because now we take pictures of everything. Everybody has their camera phones and, you know, they take pictures of, of insignificant things and significant things. And back in these times when it was amazing, this place had air conditioning in 1941 and the hydraulic lift. And there just aren't any pictures around. Next. Okay, so now we move to Hawaiian Gardens. Uh, this is out in Holly, Michigan. And if you see on the right, there's the hukilau, that's the menu to the restaurant. 
And on the left is the outside of Hawaiian Gardens. This was on Grange Hall out in Holly. And back in those days, to be driving down Grange Hall Road in 1961 and see um, this building, it had to be surprising to see, to say the least. So I'll tell you a little bit about Hawaiian Gardens. Hawaiian Gardens Resort sprouted up in a little town called Holly in 1961. At that time, the city's population was just over 3,000. The nearest big city was Flint, about 18 miles away. Hawaiian Gardens creator, Fred Barton, was born in Saginaw, Michigan in 1907. Fred was always thinking, planning, and dreaming and was known as an idea man. In 1947, he created a formula to stop radiator leaks from within called bars leaks. So any of you who are into old cars, um, you've probably heard of bars leaks. So Fred invented that out, he had moved out to California. So then, uh, in 1951, he comes back to Holly to build his the headquarters for Bars Leaks. And Bars Leaks did very well, very successful. Uh, Big Three purchased it. With the success of the business, Fred needed to be where the action was. He built a modest home near the factory back in Holly. The success of Bars Leaks gave him the financial means to travel all around the South Pacific, Hawaii, Polynesia, and New Zealand. He found the islands of Hawaii bewitching, so much so that he was compelled to build a place where others could enjoy a bit of the magic of Hawaii and the South Pacific too. He purchased the land where he would build Hawaiian gardens and Jim Livingston of James H. Livingston Associate Architects out of Ann Arbor was hired and Jack Klemp of Holly was brought in as general contractor. The project began in 1960 with a modest 24 room motel. Construction continued with 12,000 square foot building that would become Huki Lao restaurant and a large motel lobby that would connect the buildings. The resort, the resort complex consisted of 14 acres of land, the motel, a honeymoon cottage, two lakes, which he built, a par three golf course, a greenhouse, and a restaurant. Hukilau restaurant was unlike anything ever seen before, not only in Holly, but unlikely the whole state of Michigan at the time. The Bartons went all out decorating the place making it as authentic as possible. Palm trees were brought in from Florida, lava rock from Hawaii, and island timbers, thatch, and stone from the islands. They built waterfalls, tropical gardens, woven grass, and bamboo walls. The, wa the lobby was an equatorial paradise. A waterfall cascaded down a lava rock wall, and lush plants and vines transported visitors to the South Pacific. Colorful lanterns, bamboo leg tables and chairs, fresh flowers and lakeside views filled the dining rooms. Food was Polynesian or American. And at that time, you know, things like Polynesian food, that was something new and exciting and very different. The restaurant was divided into three sections by glass sidewalls, all connected by tropical courts. Plants acted as dividers. You couldn't see from one room to the next. The Banyan Court, designed in the style of a Polynesian chief's house, which you see on the left, was the largest of the three. The space enchanted guests with a waterfall, a miniature stream crossed with a bridge and carpeting the color of grass in the sun. The back wall was glass and overlooked Lake Oahu. The Polynesian longhouse was situated among bamboo walls, monkey pod wood, timbers, and colorful lanterns. The Kahili room was completely different from the others in design and function. This was the room under the geodesic dome. This is where the fabulous Sunday buffet was served and where the exciting and enchanting Royal Hawaiian Luau took place. 
The Waitoma Grotto Lounge is what many remember the most. The armchair bar and cocktail lounge serve the finest Hawaiian drinks in real coconuts, fancy glasses, or tiki mugs. Overlooking scenic Lake Oahu, the back wall of the lounge featured variegated lava rock, a ceiling of glimmering glowworms, and a live volcano. Well, sort of. The, they had built um, a volcano, and of course they named it the Mauna Loa after the, the real thing in Hawaii. Uh, so throughout the evening, the Mauna Loa volcano would erupt. It would go like this. A recording of a volcano eruption would play. At first, it was really quiet with a slight rumble, and then it would go stronger and louder until it turned into a roar. The lights in the bar would dim. The dance floor would glow red like a massive lava beneath their feet. The floor would begin to shake, and then slowly, little at a time, it would all subside. How cool must that have been? I can't imagine if, if you didn't know and you went there and you're sitting at the cocktail bar and you start hearing all of this stuff. At first, you're like, oh, my God, what's happening? And then you're just smiling like, oh, my God, that was so cool. And there was famous people who um, showed up at, at Hawaiian Gardens. Gordy Howe and Nancy Sinatra had come there. Uh, Frank Sinatra and Muhammad Ali. Okay, let's go through the slides next. There's a nice up close picture. Next. This is the cocktail menu. And of course, they, there's lots of pineapple everywhere. And most places had a drink, like they have the Hawaiian Garden Special. Planter's Punch was popular. Um, what's another popular? Of course, the pineapple bowl with the straws in it. Zombie. Next. And there's the food menu. Again, they had um, Chinese, Cantonese, Hawaiian dishes, uh, and most of these places had two separate kitchens, American kitchen and uh, uh, the kitchen for all of the um, Cantonese, Chinese dishes. Next. And there is the geodesic dome, and you can see the buffet in the middle there, and that's where they would have the luau's. Next. And that shows a little bit of everything. It's got the different dining rooms, the outside of the building. In the middle is what one of the motel rooms looked like overlooking the lake. And they did have a torch runner. So as it would get dark at night, there were torches all the way around the lake. And so one of the servers, as it got dark, would go out there and he would run, he would have his lit torch and he'd run around the lake and light all of the torches, which was very cool. He said he got lots of tips when he would do that. Next. Okay, Chintiki. Chintiki opened in 1966 and it closed in 1980 and this was on Cass um, in downtown Detroit. The Chin Tiki is Detroit's best known tiki restaurant. It certainly had the longest tenure. It opened in 1966 and closed in 1980. It was a destination that appealed to all ages, budgets, and classes. The lot at 20, 2121 Cass Avenue was once a parking structure owned by the Loyal Order of Moose. Along came Marvin Chin, a multi-talented, engineer turned restaurateur who transformed the parcel into a Polynesian jungle paradise. Chintiki not only hosted celebrities, but also became a celebrity itself after appearing in the movie Eight Mile in 2002. With new life breathing between the mural adorned bamboo clad walls, there was a glimmer of hope for a reopening, but it never came to fruition. Again, we don't really have pictures of these places. So I love the descriptions from the, the newspapers, the reporters who went and saw these places for the first time. 
So, uh, in on August 16th, 1966, the Detroit Free Press wrote this about Chintiki. Stepping out to Polynesia, right here on Cass Avenue. It wouldn't take much imagination to turn Cass Avenue's traffic rumble into the roar of the Pacific surf. So stimulating is Chintiki, Marvin Chin's dream of a Polynesian restaurant brought to life at 2121 Cass near downtown. You enter through idle carved doors beneath flaming torches. The door swings shut and Detroit is 10,000 miles away. You take a moment to adjust your eyes to the jungle light, then crossing a tiny bridge over a rippling stream, you've been taken in tow by a tiny Pacific girl who wraps a lei around your neck and leads you to a table. Some of these Eastern creatures are very small and care must be taken by tall nearsighted men not to trample any in the dim light. The dim light is a colorful light though, filtering through a wild assortment of fixtures. Many of them handmade wicker baskets, bread baskets, and what seemed to be size 28 and a half hats made of reeds. Marvin Chin and decorator Blaine Perigo put these things together during 14 months recently. Chin, who had done some Polynesian restauranting in Los Angeles some years back, started gathering materials for this one eight years ago, gradually filling a two-car garage with oriental island fixings, including great wicker chairs and exquisite black wooden chairs with splashing colors on their flowered seats. Blaine Perigo came up from Cleveland and started painting and carving and creating the atmosphere that transformed a parking garage. The restaurant is divided into cozy segments separated by bamboo and beaded partitions, the sort that Rita Hayworth might step through. At the bar, brightly shirted bartenders concoct huge jugs of smoking, bubbling, gardenia floating drinks. Needless to say, these rum-based potions should be approached with great care. There are waitresses from Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and any number of Pacific islands. Some are wrapped to the floor in brightly printed shiny cloth and others wear slashed sarongs. There's magic in the food too, exotic meats and sauces so dear to the gourmet heart. It's all so, well, different, like being somewhere else for a while. And then shortly after that, there was another article Always open on Sunday is Marvin Chin's exotic new Polynesian restaurant, the Jin Tiki on Cass, where giant fresh gardenias float on the scorpions, one of the many unusual tropical drinks, and the menu comes straight from the islands, specifically remembered the seasoned meatballs, the curry shrimp Singapore, the steak cow lapo lapo, and best of all, malamaki thin strips of marinated beef in a secret sauce. I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry. Decorative items purchased from Oceanic Arts in Whittier, California include five foot tall carved tikis of Hawaiian war gods, Maori and Tahitian figures made of palm wood, along with blowfish, puffer fish, war clubs, and ceremonial paddles. Light fixtures wore shades made of rattan in the shape of baskets, half ball, and frames. Oriental tiles of red and emerald green were used as partitions. Walls appear to be covered in bamboo matting, and rice thatch could be found throughout. The tiki mugs were generic in design and glazed in singular colors. One style bore the chin tiki name. Marvin Chin designed everything from the graphics on the front of the building to the menus, matches, ashtrays, and swizzle sticks. Everything was bespoke by Marvin, especially for Chin Tiki. When, when Chin Tiki first opened, it was just a restaurant, uh, but then they eventually added, a year later, they added a floor show. If you wanna to click to the next slide, these are the lovely ladies who would greet you when you came in. You can see 
all of the, the bamboo matting and the wall dividers. Uh, the, actually, the lady on the left was the owner, Marvin Chin. That was his younger sister. Next. And um, the, every year, it, the Michigan State Fair would have a contest back in the 60s uh, for floats. So the man on the left is the one we were talking about, Lane per Perigo, uh, who design, did all the designing and painting, that kind of thing. And this was, uh, they were being presented with the first place award for the best float for the State Fair that year. Next. And there is the float, and that is the outside of Chintiki. And we'll leave that there for a minute. Um, there, they, there was an article talking about the, the dance um, that they would do, the floor show. They do this thing with two long sticks. Two crouching Hawaiians hit the sticks on the floor at the count of a one and a two, and on three, they smack them together. The dancers move gracefully between the sticks. At the Chin Tiki, where they have just added entertainment on Thursday and Friday, this particular dance is called is called tinickling, or in English, planting rice. Amateurs are advised to avoid it. Chin Tiki offers a splendid opportunity for students of Pacific culture to study and differentiate between Samoan, Hawaiian, Tahitian and Philippine authentic dances and music. And I did have the chance to interview a lady who actually was one of the dancers uh, at Chintiki. And she said it was, it was all authentic music and costumes and the dances. So that's pretty cool to have that, to have that opportunity. Really when you, the, the Tiki restaurants, most of them, Hawaiian Gardens was different because they built it on the lake. But you came in that door, there were no windows. You were completely separate from the outside world and just brought into this Polynesian paradise. Next. There's the outside. They were talking about the torches. Um, and actually, when they when they did the movie Eight Mile, they, some of it was filmed, the bar scene was filmed inside Chintiki. And so they cleaned everything up and, and moved things around. And they were really hoping to get these torches lit uh, outside again, but, but they never were able to do that. Next. And there are some of the ladies. And they had, like I said, the authentic music, dances. Next. And there are all different areas. Um, on the left, you can see the bridge. They always talk about the bamboo bridge. Uh, on the right is the bar and that Blaine Perigo painted that mural like an aquarium. Next. And this was when they were, this was right around the time that they did Eight Mile. So some people were able to get back in and, and look around. So that's that bridge again. Next. Outside. Some of you might look at that. And go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Next. OK, Trader Vicks. Trader Vicks was the last to arrive on the Detroit Tiki scene. Located in the Detroit Hilton Hotel, it opened in 1969. It took up the entire Bagley side of the building. The entrance was on Washington Boulevard. It was a 275 seat Polynesian restaurant with two kitchens, one Chinese, one American. They used all of the signature mugs and dishes and um, that they, they sorry, <laughs> getting ahead of myself here. Um, Trader Vic's had, you know, serving dishes and their mugs, and they used all of the same things throughout all of their restaurants. And they're still in business today. You can actually go to a Trader Vic's. Uh, they have a website where you can still buy their tiki mugs, their drink mixes, uh, that kind of thing. So it was the same no matter what location. A couple of things. 
Um, if any of you have a favorite tiki drink, you can put that in the comments of any of you have ever been to Trader Vic's. Uh, it would be fun to see what city you've, you've gone to. Um, and if any of you ever were to Mauna Loa or to Chintiki, put it in the comments. It would be fun to see. Um, so this Trader Vix down on Washington Boulevard in Detroit, it was popular place for people to go after the Lions games because it was open on Sunday. Um, so the Lions, they played their last season at Tiger Stadium in 1974 and then Trader Vix closed in 1975. So you can click, there's a menu and it is interesting you know, to see all the different dishes, Taiwan, um, lots of vegetables. Next, there's a menu and there's a matchbook from the hotel, Detroit Hilton. Most of us Detroiters still think of it as the Statler. Next, there's the outside. You can see the, the tiki carvings on each side of the doors. Next, and there's where you went in. Next, and there's a there's an advertisement: exotic Polynesian cuisine, intriguing tropical beverages. Next, okay, so now we go to the Mauna Loa. In Mauna Loa, people have been fascinated by it. Um, it was only open for four years, from 1967 to 1971. And if you're familiar with downtown Detroit, uh, down in West Grand Boulevard, where the St. Regis Hotel is, the St. Regis was there, and then they put an addition on. And where that addition is, that is where the Mauna Loa was. And again, I will use their description because we really don't have have pictures. And um, this is actually from a man's name was Marvin Diamond, and he compiled this as a press release just before the Mauna Loa opened. OK, so again, use your imagination. One of the world's most elaborate restaurants, the two and a quarter million Mauna Loa Two and a quarter million dollars in 1967. Sorry. Um, one of the world's most elaborate restaurants, the two and a quarter million dollar Mauna Loa, will open its doors to the public at 11 a.m. Saturday, August 12th. The Mauna Loa is nestled on a man made lagoon at 3077 West Grand Boulevard at Cass. A waterfall rushes down a hill of volcanic lava into the lagoon. Patrons will pass under a thatched hut, then through the restaurant's massive doors for a make-believe trip through the Pacific Archipelago and India. While dining at the Mauna Loa, Detroiters will not be surprised to find members of the Detroit Tigers baseball team, Lions football team, radio and TV personalities civic leaders, and faces made familiar through the business pages of Detroit's papers. The foyer is a ceremonial hut with a red box hanging from the roof. In the islands, when a Polynesian swain takes his sarong-clad maiden into this hut, it indicates they are going to be married and spend the rest of their lives together. When the diner asks, is it real? No matter what he is pointing to, the answer is yes. The heroic island figures are authentic. So are the tiki poles with island carvings that support the ceiling. The blowfish that glow red, blue, and green are real blowfish. The enormous war canoe, one of five, came from Samoa. The 1,250 Chinese coins embedded in the bar are real. The bar tables are brass-bound hatch covers from trading schooners. The four-bladed fans that twirl languidly from the bar ceiling came from a Hong Kong saloon. The brass lamps, the ship's compass, the spears and shields are all real. 
the Chinese writing carved into some of the columns really say something, and chances are your waiter will be able to translate it for you. Yes, that's real water cascading down the lava falls and running in the stream besides your table. Take our word for it. If my lady puts her slipper-clad foot in the stream, she'll find it's real deep and she'll be real wet. If you eat in the Papit room, the Tonga room, the Lanai room, or the Maui room, your oriental waiter will be Mandarin jacketed. In the Bombay room, a turban waiter will make you feel like a member of the British Foreign Service. It is only in the Bombay room that we find something that is not real. The 3,000 gems that are embedded in the filigreed teak wood panels are not real gems, they are zircons. The Mauna Loa has two complete kitchens, American and Oriental, plus a third kitchen for, a bank, for the banquet room. Kurt Mecklenburg, who has cooked everywhere from the Bavarian Alps to Singapore, and has directed food services for the sleek ships that bring American products to the Orient and bring all of those motorcycles back here as executive chefs. The only area of the restaurant off limit to patrons are the service bars where island drinks are mixed with precision from secret formulas. You may ask the waiter for the recipe for any of the exotic dishes and Kurt Mecklenburg will see that you get it. But if you ask the waiter for the ingredients of your island drink, you will only get an inscrutable smile. And just when you think you have seen everything, you come upon a volcanic pool where a surround clad diver is about to submerge and search for pearls. And you still haven't seen the banquet facilities, which can accommodate groups from 12 to 450. The banquet decor is Mediterranean. The banquet room has an enormous barbecue pit, which can accommodate a luau, a New England clam bake, or a Texas barbecue. Okay, let's go to the pictures. Batman is, is the Robert Fenton, who this was his dream. He, he built this restaurant, and that is on the second floor, the Mediterranean room. Next. There's a rendering of the outside Grand Boulevard and Cass. Now, I always think if you were, well, even if you were from here or, or out of town on a snowy winter day and you're driving down West Grand Boulevard and all of a sudden you see this, that had to capture your attention. Next. See the torches are all lit. And you can see that beautiful entrance and all the carved tiki poles. Next palm trees. Next. Look at that waterfall. It was all the way up to the left side of the building and you can see how it goes down into the lagoon. Next. All right, so look all the way to the back of this photo. You can see a young lady sitting there. She is a pearl diver and where you see the restaurant tables and that railing, that is the deep lava pool. That was 10 feet deep. And so what you would do is you would go up to the railing and you would ask, ask the pearl diver to dive down and get you a pearl. And she would. She'd dive in the water, scoop one up. So while other shows had dancers and music and, and flaming torches, here you had a real life pearl diver. Next. That's a cocktail menu. Next. That is the dinner menu. Just beautiful. Next. On the left is a spe special occasion menu. Uh, and then they, the Mauna Loa, you know, being on the boulevard there and close to the Fisher Theater, uh, advertised in, in the program for the Fisher Theater. Next. So on the left is from the Detroit News Sunday section. Um, a totally, you can, the 1960s girl uh, hopping through the lagoon. 
and on the right the cover of the Vulcan magazine and you could that's that's a nice color picture because the the other ones you can't really see the dark wood and all the detail colors next Also in the news, um, we have the bartender on the left with some of the, the mugs that people know. Same thing on the right, you can see the little Mauna Loa ashtray and the rum barrel mug. Next. And that was an advertisement. They really, it's funny because um, like Chin Tiki, they had advertisements all Trader Vicks, they were in newspapers. Mauna Loa didn't really advertise much. So this, this was unusual to see this one uh, advertising their New Year's Eve celebration. Next, Port 03. Okay. Uh, you guys, I told you Marvin Chin, uh, he built Chin Tiki and Port 03. This was another of his ideas. Um, so the Chin Tiki was just, you know, everyone talks about how amazing that it was. Port 03 was supposed to be even, even more so of everything. Uh, and it was supposed to be three restaurants, three different kinds of food in one. So I will read you, um, this is from the Free Press, uh, June 9th, uh, 1972. All aboard Porta 3 for a Polynesian feast. Two signs point to the difficulty the latest Marvin Chin restaurant is faced with. One, Porta 3 suggests bigness. The other reading, Help Wanted, indicates that service may be predictably poor. Both indications are correct. Porto 3, Long Lake at Telegraph, is large, even though the Japanese third is nowhere near completion and the shortage of busboys leaves empty glasses on the table right down through dessert. Francis, the maitre d', does the best he can as he oversees two dining rooms, two kitchens, and a cubby of banquet facilities, but he lacks lieutenants to keep things ship shape in the ship room and the Polynesian room. Of the two, the Polynesian room is the smaller, more intimate, and easier to manage. Um, the Japanese third never did open, but I thought this was really cool. The ship room is built to look like a ship with most of the passengers sitting on the main deck and a few up on a raised portion at one end that resembles a poop deck. Ropes and rails and furled sails complete the illusion. Really, there's a ship in this building. It all but rocks. Naturally, the specialty is seafood. Exotic drinks that smoke and float flowers sell for $2.50 to $3, and all taste to a scotch drinker like melted jello. Wine comes in goblets for 90 cents. Diners make their own salads at a well-stocked salad bar on the poop deck. In two trips to Porto 3, we found the food well-prepared and served piping hot to the table. Even broiled salmon steak, a quick cooler, came on hot. Daily House, specials, Daily House specialty is unidentified on the menu, and a waitress must be queried. It was red snapper with mushroom sauce last Friday and was excellent. Upfront reservations are handled efficiently and the valet parking is fast both in and out. Dinners range from $4 to $8.45. Can't imagine. Uh, all orders are fried in butter for an extra quarter. There you go. <laughs> so it is sad. Uh, we see, I saw ads for four to three opening in 72 and it didn't last for long, um, but it was a new concept to have seafood, Polynesian and Japanese food all under one roof. So, uh, now, if that would open today, it would have been a great success, but I guess Marvin was just ahead of his time. But the whole ship thing, I just think, oh my God, I would have loved to see that. Okay, next. So there, there we go, there's an advertisement, seafood dining on the ship. Next, there's a menu and the little pics. 
Next. An ashtray. And the port of three, Marvin shared all of the same graphics. He just changed the name uh, from Chintiki to port of three, but it was all, all the same designs. Next. Okay, Chins, speaking of Marvin Chin, uh, is still in business. And that is on Plymouth Road. Uh, Chins originally opened as a takeout restaurant in 1953. And then in 1969, so after Chin Tiki opened, um, Marvin moved the restaurant down, they, they say a stone's throw down Plymouth Road, and it's still open today. So when he, when he made Chin's Chop Suey from a takeout place to a sit-down restaurant, since it was after Chin Tiki, he had all of the, you know, he had figured out how to do all this stuff. So all of the materials and decorations and um, fonts and all that kind of stuff, he made like a mini version of Chin Tiki in Chin's. So let's go to the next slide. There's the outside. And if you drove down Plymouth Road, there it is. You, you'd see just that. Next. When they closed uh, Chin Tiki, they brought all of the stuff. So these are, there's a, a tiki mug on the right. And of course, one of the volcano, um, volcano bowls. Um, so they brought all the Chin Tiki stuff to Chins and they still use that. Next. These are just some lovely pictures of the, the interior. It's just so cool that something, that this still exists and you can still go there and eat. I'm not sure during the pandemic, um, it was just carry out. I don't know for sure if the dining room is open, but if you get a carry out, you can at least poke around in there. Next. There's just some more lovely views. At the very back, if you maybe squint, you can see there's a bar tucked back there. That's the original bar from the Mauna Loa when they filmed the movie Eight Mile. Uh, the, the set designers somehow found the original Mauna Loa bar with those 1,250 coins sealed in the top. They found that somewhere, used it in the movie, and then when they were done, they gave the bar to uh, Marvin Chin, and so it's at the Mauna Loa. And those big tikis, those are from Chin Tiki. And there's the, the red and emerald green glazed tiles that I mentioned earlier. Next. Now this was originally a waterfall. The mural on the left, the glowing mural, that was done by Blaine Perigo. And to the right, well, to me, it looks like a glowing volcano. That was originally a waterfall, but they said they could never get, when the water flowed down, they could never get it to stop splashing and the carpet would always be soaking wet. So they turned off the water and it's now a volcano. Next. Okay, so then that brings us to now. Um, and we have a couple restaurants, a couple new things that opened uh, next. Okay, one more. Uh, in Detroit, the Mutiny is located on Verner Highway, and this opened in 2017. You want to click? That's what that looks like inside. Very nice. Cocktails are excellent. Next. And then another one also opened in 2017 called Lost River, and that's on Mac. Next. One more. That's what it looks like. It's like a little neighborhood bar. It, it's very cozy. Uh, the mural, anyone who's into murals, that's done by Wheezy. Next. Oh, and there's my book. There you go. Um, so that's, that's my spiel. So if anybody has questions or, you know, anything, any comments you'd like to post, Glenda? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been so much fun. I, I can't wait to uh, 
I can't wait to go and visit a tiki restaurant. Um, and um, we were we were talking a little earlier. It looked uh, we were talking about the one that's in Grand Rapids now that they've yeah. built. That's yeah. a multi-story um, uh, new tiki restaurant. Um, I f I found this postcard I was telling you about. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it's always so hard to hold something up to a camera and get it to focus. So. Just take my word for it that there, there you go. Um, oh, for, for a brief second, it's a lot of people, I found this in my grandparents' uh, uh, collection. My grandparents used to travel a lot. It's the Mai Kai, the Polynesian restaurant. It was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's still there. <laughs> well, uh, I'm gonna send you this postcard. Uh, I looked at it more closely and these people are actually, um, uh, what they're dining on is a suckling pig. They have a whole pig there um, uh, in the center of the table. Um, it says uh, there are seven different dining areas from which to choose. And um, I'm just wondering if, if uh, you could comment a little bit on why instead of there just being one room, it seemed like they had theme rooms in these restaurants. You're absolutely right, and I don't have a good answer for that. I really don't know. I my thought is they because it is um, you know I, I hate to say theme, but I guess theme. But everything was authentic. It's not you know it's not like things now that are new things that were made to look old. These were the actual things. Um, I think it just made it cozy and made you feel more like you like you were someplace different rather than being in a big space you know what i'm saying i think it's more the feeling that it gave you and you could go back seven times if they had seven different <laughs> seven different rooms <laughs> uh quick here's a question uh is trader vix still around in various locations Yes, it is. And you can go on, you, you can Google Trader Vix and it will tell you all the locations, but they are still open. You can order their drink mixes. They have like, um, you can buy their glasses, uh, different food items. Um, Tyler, are you seeing any questions? I, I just saw the one. Yep, that there was, was also the only one I saw. Okay. I'm seeing some of them. Okay. Oh, somebody went to Don the Beach Comers. Very cool. Yeah, that had to be fascinating. Yes, I'm, uh, I don't know. I think especially, I wonder, um, were, there, were there places in the country where these restaurants were maybe more popular than others? I'm thinking maybe the, uh, you know, the, the cold West, West Coast. West yeah. Coast. Yeah, absolutely. West Coast. And you mentioned Mai Kai. Um, Mai Kai was huge. That was one of the early ones. Um, I, you know, my timing, everything is off a little bit, obviously because of the pandemic, but the Mai Kai had burned down a couple of years ago. Well, a lot of it had burned. Hmm. Um, and so they didn't know if they were going to demolish it or what they were going to do. And people, because it's so loved and so well known, they were able to raise enough money and the family decided to sell it. And they're gonna, so it's gonna be rebuilt and they will reopen it. And the family is going to stick around and train the new owners on, on how to keep it going. Hmm. You know, the question here uh, says, can you say more about the costumes and the people's feelings about wearing them? You know, the, everybody I talked to, a lot of them, these were the, the places they were from. This was home to them. And these were the authentic costumes. They weren't, let's say this, it's not like they were wearing um, short or low or whatever, just for the sake of showing skin. These were beautiful, authentic dresses and sarongs and they were you know beautiful fabrics so it, and and they did they had the music and had the food it was a total that's what I love about Tiki it was a total experience everything from like I said the food the drink the, the people who took care of you yeah it's hard to think of any any kind of restaurant that 
would would go to that much trouble to replicate an entire environment. Exactly. You know, I mean, it was almost like the environment was as important or more important than the food. Although, you know, you know, the glimpses you gave us of those of those menus, it looked like they really were trying to do some authentic ish right. uh, Polynesian dishes. Yeah, and the fact you know that they had uh, chefs from from the from Polynesia and the ingredients, and that they had two kitchens, you know, a Chinese kitchen mm -hmm. and an American kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any theories as to why the, uh, the it seems like an a lot of them closed in the seventies, sixties, seventies? They were popular for a relatively short period of time, and then most of them seem to have disappeared. Any idea why that would have been? You know, I, I think it was, it, things changed. We went from, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I remember growing up, you know, you would go to a, a barbecue at someone's backyard and they would have tiki torches or the little tiki lanterns. Um, I remember my parents getting, you know, drinks with umbrellas and that kind of thing. And I, I think it just sort of wasn't mainstream anymore. But the people who truly loved the culture that's the one picture I had of the home tiki bar. They just kept right on going, you know, and they had their home tiki bar and, and they would have their Hawaiian shirts. But I think, you know, the 60s to the 70s, it turned into more um, flower child, you know, hippie, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and this was kind of like, eh, you know, it, it was out of vogue then. Just, just went on a style. So exactly. do you have any theories as to why it seems to be coming back? My what what most people agree is that the cocktails themselves, because depending on when you had a tiki drink, like for these restaurants, they had fresh squeezed limes and fresh pineapple and they made their own vanilla syrups and simple syrups and all of these kinds of things. And then eventually, you know, even the home cook we went from making everything from scratch to things that came in boxes and packages, juices you bought in cans. So the same thing happened with cocktails. You could buy a drink mix. So they would have the drink mix with the canned juices. And it just, you know, people didn't like them. They were too sweet. They were artificial tasting. Well, then the craft cocktail movement came to town. And so all of a sudden we have all of these new bartenders who are exploring and creating, you know, all of these new drinks. And they went back to the basics. They went back to making their own syrups and fresh juices. And like we always do, everything comes full circle. So they reached back and, you know, they were doing cocktails from prohibition time and then they, you know, move to cocktail, like tiki cocktails. So the drinks then really, I, I think, uh, inspired curiosity of those restaurants and, and of that, of that time. And so I think myself that, that the bartenders really brought back the brought tiki back to the forefront. Yeah. And it does seem like cocktails were a very big part of the attraction in the original restaurants. I mean, the, those were very elaborate drink menus, with the little illustrations <laughs> of yeah. the drinks. Um, okay. I, well, I've got one question here. Uh, uh, Sarah wants to know if Trader Vic's originated in Detroit. Nope. It, West Coast. West Coast. Okay. Yeah. All right. Trader Vic's, uh, down the beachcomber opened and then uh, Trader Vic's was sort of like his competition. Okay. There's a question I don't know the answer to. Did the Szechuan West in Ann Arbor originate as a tiki bar? I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. So. It did look like some of these tiki bar restaurants did make the transition to Chinese restaurants. Um, Part possibly because sometimes the owners were Chinese. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, but you know, for us, it, it's sad because Chintiki is, is gone, the building's gone, uh, Mauna Loa is gone, the tropics, that's gone, you know, the hotel that it was in. We do still have chins, so like the atmosphere of chins is amazing. And if you want, you know, really good cocktail drinks, 
either the Mutiny or Lost River, they both do a great job. I mean, a great job. And as you mentioned, Max's South Seas uh, in Grand Rapids, that is a total uh, immersive tiki experience. It, it's more like the old, like the original restaurants where everywhere you look, it's just tiki everywhere. Uh, so Janet, let's see, wants to know uh, if we want to go to the best of the tiki restaurants that remain, where should we go even outside Detroit? Oh, you know, people would always say the Mai Kai, but it's closed right now because of the, the fire. Um, you know, I really, I don't know, but if you wanted to just go locally, I mean, I have not eaten there myself, but Max's South Seas in Grand Rapids, people I know who are diehard, you know, tiki restaurant aficionados, uh, they say that Max's is right up there in experience, food cocktail. So I'm going with Max's. <laughs> I'm going to Max's too. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, yeah, okay. looks like uh, this is a Yelper says about Sichuan West in Ann Arbor. It was constructed as Jimmy Kale's Waterfalls Supper Club, in an article from 1962. So there you go. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and someone else is saying the Tonga Room in San Francisco is a yes. Is a I've heard that very good. I've not been, but you know, sounds mm -hmm. good. Well, uh, Renee, we really want to thank you so much for this presentation. It was delightful, and I really appreciate all of the uh, effort that you put into your slides. That you, that's quite a collection you have there of memorabilia. And uh, as I say, I'm going to send you my the the the. Um, I guess you would call it a, a, a Hawaiian feast with the uh, with the roast pig in the in the center of the table. I'll send that to you. Um, we want to thank you again so much. We want to thank our friends at the Ann Arbor District Library for their wonderful tech support, uh, and for uh, the members who are watching right now. Uh, I just, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our December meeting is uh, going to be uh, our theme meal. Uh, so we won't have a speaker next month. It will be uh, at the uh, Ladies Literary Club in Ypsilanti. And don't forget to send in your registration if you haven't already, if you're planning to attend. Uh, in January, we will be having another meeting on Zoom. And our speaker will be uh, Eric Pallant, who is the author of Sourdough Culture, A History of 6,000 Years of Bread Making. Uh, and there's more information uh, on that. Well, there will be more information on that on our website culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org. So with that, we will say good evening uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you're watching or good night. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you again, Renee. We really appreciate thank it. This you. has been well, great. Thank you very much.